If you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Our text this morning is Romans, chapter 1, verses 24 to 27, which I will be reading in a few minutes. But I want to make a few comments first. And that's this. There is only one final authority for what is true or what's false, what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, what is immoral, what is good, what is evil. And that's this book. That's what Bible means, the book, filled with 66 writings. It is God's infallible, inerrant, sufficient, and authoritative word. And Christians are a people of the book, so we would hope. Christians know better than to look to the culture in whatever generation they live in. They know better than to look to the culture or to popular opinion for what is right or what is wrong. Christians know better when they say, in our country now, for seven, eight, nine years, whatever a Burgerfell is, we know that even though the Supreme Court of the United States makes a ruling that two males or two females, are now considered legally married when they go through the process with their local county. Christians know that doesn't make it marriage. What societies may accept and what they may promote are sometimes that which is an expression of hatred for God. And those same things may be God himself allowing that as his judgment against human beings as a culture, as a nation, like abortion on demand, like teaching the children in the government schools and everywhere in pop culture, the idea that male and female, it's determined by whatever a person feels at the moment. Or it may be the praising of homosexuality is good and acceptable. We Christians... We're in the midst of a societal, cultural, and legal tidal wave that is bringing persecution to those who remain faithful to God's Word. Why such an ominous opening to this sermon? Well, the answer is because of what comes next as we are working our way through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. So, let us go to our text, Romans 1, verses 24 to 27, and read it and handle it carefully and honestly as 21st century American Christians. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women 
exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So let's get what we have here now, our text this morning, and make sure we get the big picture of its large context, which started back at verse 18, right? Where Paul kicks it off with, the wrath of God is, and this word revealed is in the present tense in the Greek, presently, ongoingly now, as opposed to the wrath of God, which is future on judgment day, which it's often used that way in the New Testament. He says, the wrath of God is presently, when he's writing and today, being revealed against all of us human beings because we have suppressed and are suppressing the truth of God and His goodness and His glory. Okay. That's His main point. It's been, and then we saw, look at your text, verses 19 to 23 then, is the reason for God's wrath being expressed. And in short, His argument was, it is because we all exchanged God and His glory as the object of our worship for false gods, for images, the creation, self-worship. Okay, that's it so far. And that brings us, okay, wrath of God, here's the reason, idolatry, and it brings us to verse 24. And the word that it is kicked off with, Therefore, it's a logical word, meaning because of that, because of exchanging God for the worship of creation, therefore, God's judgment, His, His wrath is being revealed in the world. Except that's, that, that is what His logic, that is what He's saying, but Paul gets specific, is what He's doing. He tells us, how is God's wrath being revealed in this age, in this world? And he says with the same term three times, verse 24, 26, and 28. In verse 24, he says this is how it's being revealed. Therefore, God gave them up. Here's the term. It means God actively abandoned them, gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. In verse 26, and for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions expressed in homosexuality. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Oh, you see Paul's clear, logical structure? God's wrath is being revealed because of our spurning of God and exchanging Him for false worship. And therefore, His wrath is revealed in God's handing them over to sin all the more. Okay, now... Our text, verses 24 to 27, that's, we're going to focus on it. Here's the simple, 
flow and look and see if you don't see it and agree. Verse 24, he says, essentially, God gave people over to sexual sin. Why? Here's a, he just reiterates the same argument he's already made before that. Why? Verse 25, that's why. Because they abandoned the true God and worshipped and served the creature. Then verses 26 and 27. In other words, because they did that, that is verse 25, idolatry. Because of that, therefore, God gave people over to same-sex desires and actions. So in summary here, to start before we go to the text slowly, all sexual desires and activity outside of the covenant of marriage between a male and a female are never to be embraced as good and acceptable or okay. They are an expression of God's judgment upon the sinful human race. And they therefore are to be repented of in coming to God's grace in Jesus Christ. Let's make sure we get Paul's point here. The main sin, the root sin here in the text is not sexual sins. It's not adultery or fornication or homosexuality. Those sins, Paul's telling us, are the consequence. They're the outworking of the rejection of God and a failure to honor Him. The fundamental sin in the passage is failure to worship. God. All other sinning is a consequence of that one main sin. The issue at hand in the universe in which we all find ourselves existing is that God the Creator should be honored. He should be praised. By the creatures who are made in His image. And Paul demonstrates that reality about God by exploding in the doxology out of the blue while he's making the argument. Doxology from the Greek word doxa. Okay, means glory. The glorification of God as he writes in verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the, here he comes, creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Grabbed hold of him. The worst thing that can happen to a person in this present world is God's wrath expressed in giving them up to sin. In other words, where He pulls back restraints and lets them go headlong into it. Jesus Christ, that's why we celebrate Palm Sunday, they lay palms on the ground. Here comes the king. We know why he was entering Jerusalem. To save sinners from such lifestyles. Oh, what a savior. And those who refuse his grace they will become part of God's permanent judgment expressed at the end of the New Testament in Revelation chapter 22. 
frightening words. Let the evildoer still do evil. Let the filthy still be filthy. So, as we approach Romans, because we're going through Romans, well, we also live in a time and a place. And we right now are swimming in a culture of what we can call this doctrine. They they love this because it sounds good to them. Progressivism. It's not progress. It's demonic regress. It's a world that takes pride in living lives without God's ethical boundaries. But the truth is, ultimately, it's just evidence of God's active wrath, of his abandonment to sexual sins, adultery and fornication, and homosexuality, and as you're going to say, a debased mind that produces all of our sins. And that is not something to fly rainbow flags over. Something to fear in order to repent and receive Jesus. So let's look. Starting with verse 24 at our text. Paul writes, Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to or unto the dishonoring of their bodies sexually among themselves. Therefore, in other words, God's response to their exchanging God as their treasure and worshiping the creature is, here's his response, God gave them up to something in this text. To what? To the dishonoring or or degrading of their bodies with one another. So the flow of his, verse 26 or 24 is, the darkened heart, see, we have the darkened heart. He's already made that clear with the fall of mankind. We're all born into sin and the foolish hearts of darkness. The light is turned out in our, our idolatry. And he says, that is why there's lust in the heart. Okay, so those darkened hearts which has produced the disorder of sexual lust. God says, he says now, gives them over to the expression of those hearts, to this word impurity. And Paul uses this Greek word in all of his list of of vices in the context. It's clearly, he's meaning sexual impurity. And the, so, dishonor, what's the opposite of dishonorable? It's honorable. Well, then what would that be? Well, it's measured when it comes to the realm of human sexuality. Honorables and dishonorable, they're measured by God's intention of creating human beings as sexual beings in order to have sex with persons, other humans, who are opposite them when it comes to male and female and in the covenant of marriage. Hebrews 13.4 concisely says it. Let marriage be held, and here's the word, in honor, not dishonor. And let the marriage bed, that is the Greek word where we get our English word coitus. Let sex in marriage be 
undefiled. Well, how would it be undefiled? He explains. Because God will judge the fornicator and the adulteress. That's what's dishonorable to marriage. So in other words, sex outside of marriage, heterosexual, between non-married persons, defiles marriage. Adultery, that's married persons having sex with others to whom they're not married, defiles marriage. And Paul is saying in verse 24 of our text, these acts are dishonoring to the human body. And all of this disgrace that has entered the human condition is a result of our rejecting God as God. Okay. Then... Jump to verse 26. He uses the same term again. God gave them up, abandoned them to, gave them over to something. Now, in other words, as his expression of wrath, he gives them up to something. Why does he do it? It's his response of what he just said in verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And the something in verse 26 that they are given up to is dishonorable passions. Or you can translate it degrading desires or or you can translate it shameful lusts. And then he goes on to explain what he means. Here it is. For, first example, their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary or against. Nature. Women, or females, he says, exchange the natural function for that which is against nature. And Paul is clearly saying God created sexual relations to be between a female and a male in marriage. And that is, in other words, the nature of the human being, how and why God created human beings as sexual beings. And we know Paul is clearly talking here in the first example about lesbianism, the way we would say it, and he's talking about it as unnatural. We know that clearly because of what he goes on to clearly unfold in male homosexuality as unnatural and against God's created order. And it's shameful. Verse 27. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion, desire for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Now, let me make a, a little note here what Paul does. Instead of Using, he's writing in Greek, and instead of him using the normal words throughout the New Testament when you're distinguishing a woman from a man, woman, gune, that's where we get gynecology from. 
gune, the, that normal one that's normally used, as opposed to anir for the, the man, not a, not a woman. He doesn't use those two words. He uses the words that are very precise to male and female. And the reason he does that, that is the words thalus for female and arsane for male. He does this because he's clearly referring back to the creation narrative of Genesis 1.27 when it says, so God created man, not the male, mankind, Adam, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what I mean is this. The Bible that Paul is referring to and it's looking at is the translation. And so are all his Gentile Christians. They're reading the translation from the Hebrew that is into Greek that was translated about 200 years before. And in the Greek... That passage, as it's translated, it goes like this. God created, okay, you don't take the Hebrew word Adam here, but the, the, the Greek word anthropos, anthropology, the study of mankind, etc. Anthropos, God created anthropos, our sane male, and thulus, female. And those are the two words Paul uses so in verse 27 of Romans 1, Paul says, Males gave up the natural relations with females and were consumed, or literally burned, with sexual desire for one another. Males committing shameless or indecent acts with males and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Now, here's a text. Here, here's a question. Paul will go on, and we'll see in two weeks from today after the Easter Sunday. He'll go on to, to, to just string out a list of our sins, right, towards the end in verses 29 to 31 of chapter 1. Why does he start off with homosexuality and just emphasize it, it here is a question? Why does he do that? Now, I, I could say it my own way, but I'd just rather quote because, because one New Testament scholar Thomas Schreiner, in, in his exegetical commentary on the book of Romans, I just says, he says it perfectly because this is the context of the whole passage that we're looking at. And so I'll quote Thomas Schreiner. It's probably because homosexuality is a fitting illustration of that which is unnatural in the sexual sphere. Idolatry is unnatural in the sense that it is contrary to God's intention for human beings. Worshipping corruptible animals and human beings instead of the incorruptible God turns the created order upside down. In the sexual sphere, the mirror image of this unnatural choice of idolatry is homosexuality. Human beings were intended to have sexual relations in marriage with those of the opposite sex. Just as idolatry is a violation and a perversion of what God intended, so too same-sex relations are contrary to what God planned when He created man and woman. End quote. Now, 
again, like I say, I, as we're going to go into the next passage and after Easter, I don't think I'm done with this text. Just to let let you know, or the or the subject. But so I want to. But I want to ask this question and let you look down at your text. Be Bible readers, and and I'm going to ask, what what sins that we're reading about here did God give them over to? The answer is same sex attraction and same sex actions. And they're not the same. Notice, it says he gave them over to dishonorable passions in verse 26. NIV translates that shameful lust. Lusts in passions, or in verse 27, the burning desires, their desire, they're not action. They are the desires that often lead to the activity, but they're not the same. The sin part that human beings are handed over to, it doesn't start with, quote, men or males committing shameless acts with males. It's not where it starts. The desires themselves are against nature. They are sinful. That's why they exist. Because of sin. The reason these against nature desires exist at all is the consequence of rejecting God as God. And, as he says... God's active turning over to those idolatrous hearts. The text says, God gave them over to dishonorable desires. Orientations. That's how we would say it today. Passions. For example, males, he says, desire or burned with passion for one another. Let's just say that in our own euphemistic way that we would say that in today's church world. God gave them over in judgment to same-sex attraction. Oh, God, oh, I don't, I got all these thoughts to come up in my mind, and I don't want to, we, we got time limits. Okay, no, no. That, that, just, that does not mean that any particular human being and people that we know or love who have same-sex attraction uh, and, and wrestle with homosexuality or used to live in it, and what, it, it doesn't mean, well, that's because somehow they are more sinful than I am. No, no, no. This is, tr- he's going to give the whole list of, it's not the point. And so let me just, before I'm going to try to make a, this other point that I started, let me just say, we as Christians should be adamant about loving and caring for other believers and unbelievers, family members, friends who are fallen human beings, but one of their massive struggles is same-sex attraction that they would love to get away with. And then those who aren't Christians, that they don't care, they want to live it out at the same time. As Christians, you'd have to go out of the world. No, eat dinner with them, befriend them, be faithful to the gospel, love them like you would any other fellow sinner who is made in the image of God. God saves many of these persons with same-sex attraction as he does those 
with, oh, natural, not against nature, heterosexual desires. Doesn't he? Okay, so heterosexual Christians, in other words, my desires are opposite sex, and I, it's not even a struggle the other way. Every heterosexual Christian who comes to Christ is still broken and affected. And that, that sin has affected their sexuality. It's not broken in its opposite sex orientation. That's God's design. But it's broken with that in all kinds of ways. And that's why the, the temptations which reside in the, the sinful broken and come to Christ. And Paul will get to Romans 7. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Well, well, I know it's right. I want to do that. Why is, has why is that come up within me? Welcome to the Christian life of battle. In other words, so... Heterosexual oriented Christians, they got to battle their sexual nature. Now, I'll let a woman speak for what a woman would do, but I know what men. They, well, you got to battle to stay away from pornography. You got to battle your own sexual lust that is, that is, look, for honest men, 95% of them. Afraid to ever tell their wives because they're women and they're not the same. That brokenness is a sinner in the sexuality. It is polygamous. Not, not, not polygamous where you have to act it out. But why did, that's why they sell every product under the sun to men with naked legs. It wouldn't work. It would be funny if you tried to do it with women. It's because... Whoom, Irrelevant of relationship. It is just the brokenness of the, 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 the sinfulness. In natural opposite sex. It's, it's battle it. Don't welcome it. Christians battle. Okay, so let me say it this way to get my point over. So, but heterosexual Christians, because that's true. Okay, and there's a battle. They must never say. Well, that's just the way God made me. And therefore, I embrace my identity as a lustful, polygamous Christian. I mean, even though I never, ever have any sex with another person outside my covenant of marriage, or as a single person, never have sex with any person, but I embrace my identity as a polygamous Christian. Never talk like that. It's dishonoring to God. And no, in the way that I said, He didn't make you that way. It's a consequence of sin. Okay. So, having said that, nor should a person who comes to Christ embrace same sex attraction as good or neutral, as long as I don't practice it, or natural. Now, I say this because there is a movement within the Christian church world. Some of you probably have no clue about it. Some of you may, okay? They talk about side B Christianity. Just go look it up. The revoice movement over the last four or five years in Presbyterian Church USA and then filtering elsewhere. It is this movement to say Many of us Christians who have come to Christ and we're still same-sex attracted, and God doesn't see, I want him to take it away, but he doesn't, are it's a movement to refer to oneself as an identity as a, quote, gay Christian, end quote. Even though we know we're not, the, the side B is, no, they recognize it is sinful to actually commit homosexual acts. 
but not sinful in any way. I am just that way. So I am, I identify as a gay Christian. That should be flatly rejected. Finally, all of this sexual sinning is part of God's punishment during this present age, as we see, which then, look at it, he reaffirms at the end of verse 27. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. What's he saying? The penalty for their error does not mean that because they commit homosexual acts, they're going to receive a penalty or a punishment for that. That's not what he's saying. The penalty is not something in addition to homosexual sinning. Notice, it says, the error deserves the punishment or the penalty which they are receiving in themselves. Okay. The context is clear. The error is rejection of the true God for idols. They receive the penalty for that in themselves, their sinful desires and actions growing within them. And all of us do is he's going to list at the end of this chapter. Sin. So get the flow of what Paul's saying. Condense down his logic, and I quote him from verse 18 down and hear him. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty. For their error. Now, as I close and we enter Passion Week, no matter which sins are unique to each sinner, remember, don't get the big picture what Paul's doing here in Romans. He's just laying the foundation. Paul's argument here doesn't just end. It's leading to the wonderful news of God's offer of salvation from His wrath through Jesus Christ. Which means to anybody who has not come to faith in Christ, no matter the depth of anybody's sin, he or she who wants them to be forever and everlastingly forgiven. There's only one place that we look to this week in a way we don't look as focused throughout the year. And that is that Christ nailed them on the cross. One thing, as he says, come unto me. Oh, you are burdened, heavy laden, you will find eternal rest, forgiveness, and a joy unspeakable and filled with glory through Jesus Christ. One more thing. For those of us who have fled for refuge in Jesus, Paul has words for us. And I'm going to end by quoting him. Because these words 
are the, another impetus in a few minutes as we raise our voices and praise his holy name in ending this service. And here he goes. He writes to believers. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's his words. And such were some of you No matter the depth of past sins or struggles presently. If you battle because you stand on Christ, he says. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were set apart, Christian. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. Let's pray. Father, you and your ways are so wonderful and that you did